Turn 4. The theory proposed and popularized by highly skilled and respected Faria player Zaldan Fox. The theory posits that, in a majority of games, the winner can be predicted with high accuracy after turn 4. I'm Pseudo, and I hope with this video I can both convince you how solid the theory is, as well as give you the knowledge to use this theory to improve your own in-game decisions. Before I begin the more in-depth explanation of turn 4, let's look at three simple scenarios which could then be referenced later to simplify the idea into an understandable concept and move from there into an executable strategy. Imagine a fist fight between 10 individuals, 5 on each team. Let's imagine they choose to begin as 5 one on one battles. At some point, one of the fighters will be out of the fight. This is where things get interesting. Now there are 3 one on ones and 1 2 on one. Regardless of the outcome of the one on ones, it's very likely the 2 on one will go in favor of the 2. Let's assume one of the one on ones ends in favor of the team with less fighters while the 2 on 1 goes as expected. Now there are two 1 on 1s with another 2 on 1. Seeing a pattern here? The team with more fighters always has the advantage, even if the team with less can take an even trade later down the line. Let's assume the 2 on 1 goes as expected, while the 1 on 1s remain even. Now the small advantage given by the early knockout has snowballed into double the fighters on one team, giving us two instances of 2 on 1. Even if one of the fighters on the team of two takes out one of the other team, the two on ones are likely to end in a victory for the twos. For the second scenario, we're going to look at the same starting positions of five one on ones. This time though, we will assume the fighters are evenly matched and slowly take each other out, reducing both teams at the same rate. First from five, then to four, then three, two, and finally, a single victor. While possible, this scenario is extremely rare due to the necessity that the teams be evenly matched. Even a small imbalance will turn the tides early for one side. Third, we have the most unlikely scenario, yet a necessary one if we are going to do a complete analysis. Imagine the same start to the fight as in scenario one. A fighter goes down, putting one team at a one fighter advantage. This time, however, instead of snowballing, an incredibly strong fighter on the losing team manages to take down two of the opposing fighters. Again we see two one-on-ones and one two-on-one. But the tides have turned, and the team that was down a fighter is now up. Let's assume the rest of the fight plays out as expected, with the two-on-ones going to the twos, and the team up a fighter ending with the last two players standing. Now that we've gone over those scenarios, let's apply them to Faria. In Zaldan Fox's original article, the simple undertone is that the player who gains the first advantage is the player likely to win. This is where our first scenario comes in. The fighters are not creatures on the board, but rather engagements that happen throughout the game. The first team to take down a fighter has a high chance to take favorable trades and end the fight with their own fighter standing. Translation? The player who wins the first engagement is most likely to build up the necessary resources and board presence to take favorable trades throughout the rest of the game and earn a win as a result. The article posits that this is most likely to happen on turn 4 and explains why. On turn 0, or before the game begins, both players have 0 area and 0 land. Over time, lands are placed in such a way as to prepare to engage the opponent and Faria builds up while little action occurs. The critical moment when players attempt to take control of the opponent's side most often occurs when lands meet, which, as shown by this image from the original article, most often occurs on turn 4. By this time, both players have likely built up a large store of Faria and have many cards in hand to play. The player to come out on top in this engagement is the player most likely to win. Now let's translate the other scenarios. Through them, I have attempted to cover a basic form of as many interactions as possible which might occur in a game of Faria. In the rare case of Scenario 2, the teams must be evenly matched. This represents equal trades throughout the game where neither player takes a large enough advantage to ensure favorable trades the rest of the game. The end result? A game that goes to fatigue pulling from a minute advantage to give one player the win. The advantage could be as little as one less draw during the game or a small amount of face damage. Keep in mind that, 
In general, the player has been able to draw more often, will more likely draw the answers they need, or more quickly draw their win conditions. Only after this rare edge case will the player who has drawn less have the advantage described here. Hopefully by now you can translate the third scenario on your own, but for the sake of completion and to ensure complete clarity, I will go over it. In this extremely rare case, the team that comes out with the win is not the team to take the first interaction favorably. Rather, at some point during the game, the player who is behind takes a trade of such high value they are able to pull ahead. Understanding how this can happen is critical to the theory. Without it, the theory would collapse under what I believe should be the first and most basic question that is asked about any new theory. Have we accounted for confirmation bias? I've placed the comeback as the second interaction for the sake of brevity, but this kind of shift can occur at any point in the game of Feria. The two most common occurrences of this I can think of are AoE on a thin board and hard removal on a highly invested in creature. The first happens when the player in the lead plays too many small creatures at a time and loses them to Firestorm or Garrodin or, more rarely these days, Doomsday. The second happens when a player invests a lot of buffs or Faria into a single creature which is then removed using Last Nightmare or effectively removed using Frogify. I expect by now you have a basic understanding of what turn 4 is, but I want to explore for you some insights about the theory which you may not catch right away. First, I want to address the issue of turn 4 specifically. Not the underlying theory, but rather the question, does it have to be turn 4? Hopefully anyone who has taken a physics class is aware that the widely accepted value for the acceleration of gravity is 9.81 meters per second per second. What I hope they also remember is that this is only the most common value. Obviously if you leave the Earth's surface, the value of gravity is likely to change. But even on the surface of the Earth, the acceleration of gravity changes slightly depending on the density below the area in question. This is the case with turn 4. 4 is only the most common turn one player gains an advantage, and even in normal games this can vary slightly between 3 and 5. In an abnormal game, like one with an OTK deck, the deciding turn can vary considerably. The exception of OTK is an issue I'll address later in the video. Now on to the issue of when to surrender. I've heard a lot of complaints about this one in relation to the growth of the turn 4 meme. For those who don't know, the turn 4 meme is the idea that, after turn 4, since you can predict the winner, the predicted loser may as well surrender on turn 5. Like most memes, this ignores the complexity that turn 4 actually presents. Still, it does a good job bringing out a little salt in chat if you need some to cook with. Before we dismiss this meme as nonsense, let's look at a game where early surrenders are common. Chess. A game between two high level chess players will end many turns before the actual checkmate because the player in the losing position knows the other player has the positioning, ability, and knowledge necessary to win. To understand why this shouldn't and doesn't usually happen in Feria, let's look at the issue present in all predictions. Unknown and unknowable variables, or maybe more simply, incomplete knowledge. Without all the variables, it is impossible to give a prediction at 100% certainty. The weather, for example, is rarely predicted to be 100% or 0% chance of anything. Occasionally forecasters may say that is the case, but even then they are simply rounding to avoid boring those looking for a simple weather update. Even after measuring the most important variables, other unmeasured variables still exist which can change the outcome of even the most certain predictions. In Feria, this is most commonly present in the form of RNG, everyone's favorite idea to pass the blame to for their poor play. Another variable is that which I just suggested, poor play. Either through a lack of knowledge or through a psychological process, a player on tilt for example, poor play can turn any prediction on its head. At this point, I hope I've given a solid overview of the turn 4 theory and want to move on to the more pragmatic side of the theory, how to improve your in-game decisions. This is harder to convey because it is much more situational, but I'll generalize with three main ideas. Firstly, you want to look at what the opponent is doing and what they might be planning to do to take that early lead that puts them ahead. Second, you want to look for opportunities to take a strong engagement and take the lead for yourself. Third, look for ways to follow up an engagement with board control. The first means keeping an eye out for surprise trades your opponent might be looking for. This may be difficult at first, 
but over time they can become second nature. The most common things I look out for from the opponent are mobility plays like Flashwind, Prophet of Tides, Sagami Grove Caller, or Silent Horsemaster, buff trades like Gift of Steel or Elderwood Embrace, and area of effect plays like Garrodin or Firestorm. While this may sound like a lot at first, it could be quickly narrowed down based on the available mana and lands of your opponent. The second involves looking for plays which allow you to take control over collection and land positioning. This can be as simple as taking a value trade or as complex as setting up a surprise play on your opponent without telegraphing the play and allowing them to react. With these two ideas, your in-game decisions surrounding turn 4 can help you compete with the best, as well as improve your understanding of why you win or lose games, which allows more accurate self-evaluation which is invaluable in the quest for self-improvement. The third idea I would rate the least important and is more a way to fine-tune your game after you've had practice with the first two. Follow-up plays sometimes look like losing value you could have later, but if it gives you board control, that value is much stronger early on. An example of this is playing an early yellow or blue Colossus. Maybe it costs 7 instead of the full reduction, but stopping the opponent from getting a foothold can be a strong step towards victory. Now I'd like to address the OTK decks and racing. The more general issue in question here is winning with no board control. To understand this in the perspective of turn 4, we must realize that it is an exception to the premise of the theory, not a problem with the theory itself. Turn 4 predicts the winner based on board control, but board control isn't the true goal of the game. The true goal is to set the opponent's life to zero. Board control is usually the strongest means to that end, not the end in itself. An OTK deck hinges on a window of turns to deal 20 damage directly and ignore board control completely. The same goes for a race, but with the difference that a race is a way for a player with stronger orb positioning to win a game in which they have lost board control. A perfect example of this comes from the game of StarCraft, in which the goal is to destroy all the opponent's buildings. Rarely is that goal ever seen though, as most players surrender after a large engagement in which one player takes a decisive army lead. The idea of a base race in StarCraft is the idea that one player may be able to destroy all the opponent's buildings before the other player can do the same, usually started by one player being out of position, regardless of economic or army advantage. The base race is an uncommon end to the game. As I wrap up what I hope has been an informative monologue, I'd like to highlight a more subtle aspect of turn 4 that can cause a player to misinterpret their turn 4 advantage, Feria, as in mana. Although I recommend always keeping track of your opponent's Feria, I suggest you pay special attention for a few turns after you feel you've taken a turn 4 victory. If you've taken a winning position but the opponent still has 15 Feria and 8 cards in hand, expect an answer. The first to move isn't always the winner on turn 4. Sometimes a stronger answer will give the reactionary player better control. If you have any comments related to the video, I'm always open to constructive feedback. If turn 4 is still an enigma to you, feel free to leave an exclamation mark egg in the comments. I'm Pseudosphere, and I hope this video will get you a step closer to knowing yourself, knowing your opponent, and ultimately, knowing your outcome.